Once again, welcome to our Silicon Valley Leader Symposium, and uh, delighted to see you here. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Martin Pearl, 1995 Nobel Laureate in Physics. Dr. Pearl is a professor of Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, and that's part of uh, the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory in Stanford. Dr. Pearl considered that uh, he received an outstanding education in high school and in college that laid a strong foundation for his career in research. His um, parents are immigrants from Russia, had very high expectations for their children and especially schoolwork. Sound familiar? And needless to say that uh, he uh, worked hard, excelled, met and exceeded his parents' uh, expectation. Dr. Pearl obtained his uh, bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and from the Polytechnic Institute of Brooklyn in 1948. He went on to work for General Electric. His job at the GE required him to learn about how electron vacuum tubes worked, which led him to take evening classes in physics and, and calculus, and that sparked his interest in physics. Later, he decided to pursue a graduate degree at the Columbia University in 1955, he received his PhD in physics from Columbia University. In 1995, he received his Nobel Prize in physics for discovering the tau lepton. What is that? It's an elementary particle that's similar to the electron. He continues to apply his creative approach to research today as a member of the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratories Particle Physics and Astrophysics faculty. Today he will talk to us about the creativity and risk in technology. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Martin Pearl, 1995 Nobel Prize Laureate in <laughs> Physics. Great pleasure to be here. Uh, I started out, as, as the dean said, as a chemical engineer, and then later uh, switched to into physics. But for me, there's never been a major difference between engineering and research. I like to work with things, uh, work with my hands. Uh, I'm not a machinist, but I can make simple things, and I like to design things, design structures, work. And uh, so engineering and research have always mixed in for me, and I'm always interested also in what works and doesn't work uh, in the real world, and that's, that's always interested me. So I'm going to talk about these things and tell you what I've found uh, in my world. Okay, now... Creativity is everywhere, in the arts, in architecture, in literature, and in engineering and in science. But for us, we who are in engineering and in science, creativity has the limits of the natural laws. You can think of beautiful things, um, spaceships, for example, but if, and if you look at it, you see you haven't got enough energy to get to Pluto with it, then it's not for us. We always need to have something which works according to the natural laws and also if we're in the world of commerce has a market. I mean, those are our realities and let me give you some examples. Perpetual motion. This, thousands of years, people have dreamed about perpetual motion. That is, you get something to produce energy and you don't have to put energy in. Now, the best we know now is you cannot do that. That energy is what we call conserved. Is that obviously always true? We don't know. There's some confusion around because there's this energy in the universe called dark energy, which some of you have heard of, which was only recently discovered, and that seems to be creating itself. But no one knows what it is. I've started working on it. 
The point is, if you think you can produce energy, then you really have to do experiments and you're going against a long established law. We're limited by the laws of matter right now and we have made a lot of progress, tremendous progress, particularly in this area, by making our own materials, layers of materials, special materials, alloys. So we have made a lot of progress. But so far, everything we do depends on the elements we know. A very interesting question, which is for the, this generation, is this question of dark matter. We do know that a, most of the matter of the universe consists of this particular matter, which is around, which the astronomers discovered, and is real matter in the sense that gravitation attracts it, and that's how it moves around. And it has a lot to do with the way the universe is formed. Will we ever be able to do anything with dark matter? Well, so far we know that it's not affected by electrical or magnetic forces. But who knows? So that's something open for the future. Will there other be other kinds of matter? Nothing is closed at this point. But it depends upon uh, discovery and understanding new things. Now, many things we do, particularly in engineering and technology, we do by rules of thumb. That is, we've learned to do it from other people, we've learned it ourselves. And the rules of thumb are often right, but sometimes they have to run against new discoveries. And the example I give here, for years, ulcers uh, were considered due to stress. And in all the movies, the rich old men were given milk and crackers, but in fact, we know it's due to an infection. Another example of rule of thumb has to do, is in medicine, isn't it, backaches. Nobody really understands back pain in any general sense. And if you ask why, it's because people come in and they give you a diagnosis, they tell you how they feel, and then they do an MRI, but we have no way to look at the details of the pain. That will be solved. Through electronics, there will be better and better understanding of... Um, what causes, say, back pain. And, and you know there's always been this switch. Years ago, you were told to lie in bed uh, for six weeks. Now they tell you, get up the next day and run around. That will be settled, but only through technology and new instruments. Okay, now feasibility. That's the most important thing we have. This is a picture of an airplane in the early days, 1920s, and people, Remember, the Wright brothers had two wings, and people started putting on more and more wings. Why not? If two is good, three is better. And this is an example. Now, these things get very clumsy, very heavy. And uh, this is not practical. It's not economically feasible. So we have to avoid these things. Now, you don't always know. So part of the risk in going ahead is, is what you're doing going to be feasible, going to be economically practical. You can't always tell. But uh, sometimes you can sort of smell which way it's going to go. Now this was, <laughs> even the wisest people make mistakes. Uh, about 19, late 1950s, the U.S. Uh, was depending for its defense on airplanes carrying uh, nuclear weapons. And the idea came, why not build a nuclear airplane which you could send up and would, didn't need fuel, it had a reactor in it, and it would just circle for days and days. Uh, research went ahead, uh, GE built a special test reactor on a test stand. Now, what is the problem? The problem is radiation. How are you going to protect the crew from radiation? So the idea you can see sort of is, uh, reactor in the front, crew way in the back. But you can think of many other problems, crashes within, within the uh, nuclear fuel, and it's heavy. And uh, of course, what, what happened in Ted was the intercontinental ballistic missile. But 
even very smart people make mistakes, and, and this was a mistake. Now, another interesting mistake was the Concorde. Everyone in aeronautics loved the Concorde. It looks beautiful. Why not fly supersonically, get two hours from uh, San Jose to Tokyo, and so forth and so forth. Only 20 were built. What went wrong was, when they started out the design, there was not enough details. In fact, it wasn't strong enough, and they kept strengthening it. And then the weight got too high, so they made it smaller. So I've never been in a Concorde, but those who have tell me that it was very uncomfortable. The ceiling was very low. They only built 20 of them, a tremendous, uh, it was, uh, subsidized by many of the major governments in Europe, and it was a failure. Uh, I think this could, this could have been seen. There's nothing in this uh, that the aeronautical engineers didn't already know about the power and the structure. Okay, now, what are the conditions for creativity in engineering or science? Well, you have to be competent in mathematics. There's just no way around it. You don't have to be a creative genius most of modern mathematics is incomprehensible to everybody but the mathematicians. Certainly to me, most of the mathematics you will use is actually 19th century mathematics, differential equations and so forth. Uh, maybe someday you will be using 20th century. Okay, now you have to be competent in it because that is the language of engineering and science. So. If you're not competent, and if it really bothers you, you should just, there are many, many other fields. Visualization, okay. You have to be able to visualize both in time and space what you're doing. You have to be, you're developing a product. Say you have this medical device which is going to somehow understand, be able for you to find out the source of pain in the back better. Uh, of course, that's complicated. Is the pain come from here? Is it produced in the brain? And there's a lot of work done. You have to visualize how it will come along, how you will make it, how it will be used. It may be vague, so you have to visualize it. And then you have to visualize it, if you're, it's probably going to be mainly electronic, what the circuits are going to be like, how you're going to do it, how you're going to build it. So there are many ways to visualize things. Uh, you can draw it. Uh, you use the computer a lot. Uh, you can think about it in many different ways. But if you don't have a good ability to visualize what's going to happen, it's not the thing, it's not the thing uh, for you. So you need the ability to visualize. So there are many ways to do it. And this is, I'm not going to try to, but for example, in my field, we visualize in the, in the early stage by representing particles uh, as points, we don't understand what they are. An electron is extremely small, maybe it has no size, which is a philosophical problem that the physicists of today have abandoned. If something has no size, where is the information that it's an electron? How does it know it's not something else called a muon or the tau? Anyway, we visualize it this way, a positive electron and a negative electron collide. They go into energy. Energy is unstable and they break up and they can break up to other particles such as this pair of mu's. That's our way of visualizing it. Eventually we actually, actually have to calculate. The calculations have been known for many years how to do this. But this is the beginning. If you're thinking of making a new kind of particle, these are the kind of diagrams you do first. So this is our way of visualizing. And then these are more complicated diagrams, and they're called after the famous physicist Feynman. Now, most of all is imagination. And you have to start from some very loose, open idea of what you want to do, what this product should be, or what this research should be, and then you have to refine it down to what you can do, to what you can afford, to what the technology allows. But imagination is very... And so many of us, of course, have a, this tremendous interest long-term in science fiction because that, that's one of the ways. But we're now way beyond science fiction. Certainly nobody 
in science fiction predicted what the electronic world or the chemical world would do today. I mean, it just no predictions. Now, <sighs> laboratory skills. You, sh you may be good in the laboratory, looking through a microscope. Some people see immediately, oh, there's that, uh, that's, that, those microbes, I've stained them and I see them. Other people have a lot of trouble seeing it. Uh, telescopes are not so important anymore because you actually photograph them electronically and you can just look at pictures. If you have a lot of laboratory skill, then you, you go into research which involves that. And it may be the same in engineering. If you like to build things, Legos for example, then you would go into those sorts of things. On the other hand, if, if video games are your thing, then they would probably tend to do another game. That's also a laboratory skill, video games, by the way. It's, uh, I have a grandson who's uh, done some video games for uh, the iPhone, in which you, it's a ski game, and doesn't, it's very hard, I can't do it, but if that's your thing, then you go that way. Now, not everybody has to be good in the laboratory, even those who are experimentalists, like my professor Robbie. He had very good ideas. He was simply not good uh, with machinery. He was clumsy. So, but you evaluate that. You may want to go into more design work, into more theoretical work if you're not happy in the laboratory or if you don't ever want to see a machine shop or if you don't ever want to see a, an electronic foundry. Now, getting a good idea. There is no rule for how to get a good idea. And I'm just going to mention a few people. Panofsky was the one who founded my laboratory, and he was a very calm, logical person, and had tremendous vision. Feynman, who you all know about, was a real genius, uh, was stra a strange man, a difficult man, a uh, bad teacher, although the books that have come from him are good. Hopper, Grace Hopper, is the, is the one who invented the compiler. She gets very little credit, of course, for the usual reason that until recently people simply ignored the work of women. And she's yet another one. Edison, of course, we all know about, uh, has yet another temperament, and he just did everything. He was a great pu publicist, not so good businessman, but he just would try everything. Madame Curie, uh, yet another type. Turing, who was so important in computing, then there's this strange man, Perelman, who's a Russian, very uh, reclusive, uh, made this tremendous mathematical discovery, and he refused the field medal. He just, just works by himself somehow. Uh, my final example is Rosalind Yalo. She's quite amazing. Uh, she started out as a laboratory assistant, and her idea it's one of these great creative ideas which in the time in the 70s seemed so, seemed so hard and now is so obvious. People were, how do you trace what's in the body, what you put into it? And she said, well, add some radioactivity to it and look for the radioactivity. It's obvious. But she somehow got the idea. Uh, how that came, you don't know. Now, Creativity and, and uh, innovation skills, people have attempted to teach them. Uh, I think they're okay, but I think you need the true, you need the true, uh, um, reality of, of who you work with and who you're working with in order to do this. Uh, and that's really only outside. Okay, now here are hints. Keep your eyes and ears open. Now, the fields that you're all in are now vast. So you cannot read a lot, you can't cover a lot. But listen to what friends are saying, listen to what's doing. Avoid the prejudice of not invented here don't reinvent the wheel. 
you can, if, if someone has an idea uh, and you can either license a patent or it's free or uh, it's a research idea which is not patented and it's a good idea, just copy it. I mean, acknowledge it and give people credit, but just take it. Don't try to invent what's already been invented, okay? Now remember, you can learn from many different people. In my group, uh, we're building a new system which is an, uses ultra high vacuum. It's not enormous. And when we have meetings, uh, as myself and a couple of students, and another more senior person, and uh, when we're discussing the vacuum, we always get the welder in who's going to do part of it and some other people. And sometimes I even have gotten in a salesman from a vendor because if it comes to welding this stainless steel thing together, the welder is going to know more than we do. And when we say, let's design it this way, he might say, or she might say, that's a very hard to weld. It can be done, but it's risky. So we listen to everybody. I found, I learned a lot from vendors and their salesmen. Come in, we'll talk, I'll tell them what we're doing, they'll tell us what they're doing. I learn a lot from them. I learn a lot from our uh, purchasing people. What do they think? Is this company good, is this company bad? Now let me give you an experience. We were doing another experiment in which we were looking for particles which had the wrong charge. Everything, every particle we know has a charge of the electron plus or minus or no charge. Why is that? Why aren't there other charges? So we would make little drops and measure their charge. And particularly we had the idea that we should mix in meteorite. So we would grind them up and we were trying to make a colloidal solution of them. Uh, at Stanford, we have quite a number of people who know about colloids. When I went to talk to them, they said, oh, uh, meteorite, ground up meteorite's too messy. It's got different oxides in it. It's got some metal fragments. You don't want to think about that. There's no good w way to do it. Then so, two of my graduate students went to a meeting of the American Chemical Society on colloids, and they met a lubrication engineer. And he said, oh, that problem is the same problem we have in the auto industry because the oil is supposed to carry the fragments of burnt, unburned carbon, metal fragments, those sorts of things which um, are not, they don't want deposited. And he told us, what they do in the auto industry for their oil. And then he said, actually, you take the oil you're using and add a little bit, in this case, castro oil. And it worked. In fact, we were able to make a colloidal s a solution which worked well, and that's how we got the experiments done. So you can learn from everybody. Do not go into, say, nuclear po uh, power through nuclear fusion. It looks like a bad field. Uh, there are also fields which simply are not supported by industry or government and don't go into them. So you have to choose what you're going into. There is a real world out there. And let me talk a little bit more about this nuclear fusion for power. One way is to confine, you have to get things very hot and get ions so you can find them in a magnetic field. It's called a plasma. The problems are enormous. And the major problem is a very interesting one for everyone who's in engineering. Much of what you do, you do through prototyping. Suppose you have a new chip, which is going to be great. You don't make a million. You make a few thousand at great expense. And then you test them. You uh, do uh, see how well they, uh, what their uh, lifetime is and so forth. This thing, this tokamak, won't work when it's small because you have this gas and then the walls. And every time 
and that ion hits the wall, it's absorbed, and that's the end of it. So you have to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And this one is going to be the biggest one yet. It'll be ready in 15 years, maybe. Okay, that's very hard to do. And uh, it's one of the big problems. The other thing, which is something being done at Livermore, uses a lot of lasers to try to make nuclear fusion. They're using about 200 of them now. They can only run this thing every few hours for one. It's got many, many problems. And it's the same thing. You can't get this working with two lasers or 10 lasers. And even 200 is not enough. So you cannot prototype. And that's the thing then that has a bad economic future. And uh, the bottom one goes on because it has military uh, things with it. The upper one is simply refusal of a community to give up and say, that this is not power. I mean, this is equivalent to Tokamak, to, to, to the steam automobile. Sweet idea, nice idea, never going to work. Now, partly supported, I'm hard to say, is my old field of high energy physics. Um, we're building this built, uh, you know, you've all heard of the large machine uh, in Geneva and CERN, which is a beautiful machine, and it's gotten, after some troubles, uh, is now working reasonably well, but it's at half energy and somewhat reduced in intensity. And we have proposed from Slack even a bit, better one, bigger one, but it's not going to be built for a very long time. These machines have a particular problem. This large, let's see if I, I don't know if I have a picture of it. No, no. This large Hadron Collider is very big. It has 17,000 magnets, each of which, of say, in order to make sure that it doesn't get hot, have three or four thermostats on them. That means you're having 17, 30, about 70,000 of these thermostats. If one of them fails, then the machine has to be shut down because it might mean that it's overheating. So that's a very big problem. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't make millions and millions of things that work all together. The cell phone's an example, but this is a particular problem. And it's just a, poor, a, a purely a poorly supported field. The United States mostly wants to get out of it right now. And at Slack, uh, we've changed completely now. We work mostly on uh, photon science and x-ray science and astrophysics. Now, be patient with yourself. When you're thinking of any, uh, talking ideas, it takes not take years. I finished up the, uh, the other experiment, which had to do with uh, looking for particles with strange charge a couple of years ago, and I wanted to do the next thing. I looked at many things, continue that, search for very, very heavy particles that could not be produced. And then I thought about the direct laboratory detection of dark energy. And uh, it took me about a year or two to sort through this. And then I decided to go in a direct la laboratory detection of dark energy, because I had an idea which most people think is too uh, chancy, but I'm going to, but I'll tell you a little bit about it at the end. Now, there were many bad ideas. And sometimes they're held by the whole community, and sometimes you're held by yourself. As you get ideas, expect that most of them will be bad. Uh, you'll think about them uh, at quiet moments, or sometimes with friends, you say, we can do this, we can do that. And then the next few days, it will dawn on you, or a colleague will gently tell you, uh, that's not going to work. So expect mostly bad ideas. Now, even great engineers have bad ideas. Tesla, who was one of the greatest of the wireless engineers, and also uh, AC power en engineers developed many things. He had an idea that you can transmit energy through space, a lot of it. Now, you can do it in modern, you can do it with microwaves now or lasers now, but he thought you could do it with uh, ordinary radio frequencies. And you can't because it just spreads out too much. Why he had that idea, no one has explained. There's no good scientific biography of him. How a man who understood so well these things 
when he thought about this, but it was the wrong idea. Now, sorting out good ideas and takes time, takes working with colleagues. My colleague Eric Lee would always say, can you change a bug into a feature, something that's no good into something that's good? Well, sometimes that can be done. Now, the group think problem. We do a lot by committees now, partly for management reasons and partly because uh, we need a lot of people when we're trying to design something which takes many different fields. In the group think problem, which is this excellent book, he studied political decisions. Uh, eventually, you do come to a decision often guided by the chairwoman or chairman, and objections tend to get buried in the end in order to get a, a, a solution. Very interesting one he discovers, he discusses, because there's a lot of data, a lot of papers on it, is the invasion by, uh, revolu by anti-revolutionaries of Cuba in the 1960s under Kennedy. And that was all planned. The U.S. did support it. Somebody early pointed out that the, the revolutionaries, anti-revolutionaries, didn't have any airplanes. And you do need air cover during an invasion. And we said, well, we'll send in some U.S. planes. And then it thought, that's not such a good idea because it'll raise international uh, anger and so forth. And the idea somehow got, the f got forgotten. The invasion went ahead. As it was a failure, and one of the reasons was that the U.S. planes came in a little bit, but they were afraid to come in too much. And there was an example of a decision in which they wouldn't pay any attention to the one or two people who pointed out a real problem. So groupthink is often good, but it can be a problem. Now, in my own, f in my own field, uh, we did try to build about in the 1990s a machine which had been very big in Texas called the Super Collider. It would have been bigger than the machine being built now. And the tunnel was built and so forth. Then the, some worries occurred that it would not run very well. And the director, a very, very bright man, but not a builder of accelerators, called a w committee of wise people together. And they looked at it and they said, oh, well, we've got to make it bigger. Not in the circumference, but the tunnel has to be made bigger, and the magnets have to be made bigger. That up the cost about a factor of two or so. Congress got worried, and it was shut down. What was the right answer to this? The right answer to this was to build it, in this case, as a side. It would have sort of run. And once it had been demonstrated that it sort of ran, then we could have gotten more money uh, to, to fix it. That's sort of what happened with the Hubble telescope, as you know. Okay, colleagues. Very few of us can work alone anymore. Some mathematicians, philosophers. So find colleagues to work with who are smarter than you or more skilled from you. And they may know some things. They may know other things. Always look for people who are the best you can find to work with. Don't have any envy of that. That's very important. And this is the group which we had to a few years ago which worked on this uh, looking for fractional charge. And some of them are in industry now and some are in universities. And it's very, a very good group. Now, avoid the following. In many, any group, social or technical, there are people who are fast talkers. And you say, you know, maybe I can build it this way. And they'll say, no, no, no. You can't do that because souls have tried it. It doesn't work. Or you can't do that because aluminum is too brittle. And it's going to, you can't. Uh, avoid such people's colleagues. You can check with them, but don't work with them because they will suppress the ideas as they come forth. As new ideas come, let them percolate. To, let them be out for a while. If they're wrong, you'll find it or your colleagues will find it in the end. So I, I always avoid these people, though I will go talk to them separately. Now, the most important thing is the art of obsession. Whatever you're working on, a new bridge, 
that you're working on part of the design, the chip, research and biology, you have to be obsessed with it. It has to be up in your mind. If you wake up in the middle of the night, uh, you shouldn't be thinking about your boyfriends or your girlfriends or even your children or your spouse. This should get to you. It should be pervades you. And that's, of course, the joy and the fun of it. So obsession is part of it. Now, however, time may come when the idea or the work, even though my alpha has to be dropped. It may have to be dropped because you've run out of money. It may have to be dropped because you ran into a, uh, my friend uh, Eric used to call a showstopper, something you cannot get around with technically. It may be dropped because the competitors come out with a better one and that's it. Give up the obsession quickly. Just drop it and move on. Don't keep grinding away at something which is, you can see, is a dead end. That is, let your pride go. Colleagues who care about you say, well, it didn't work. This is my problem. This is my mistake. And go on. Now, I'm almost cold. I want to talk to you about technology because that's what we're interested in. Now, when you do technology, there's going to be bad days and good days. The days when things are not working or you've sent out a prototype and the people and the foundry sends it back and made it wrong. All sorts of things. A bug in a computer code deep down somewhere. But if you like part of the technology or the software, the mathematics, it will still interest you. So you must work on something that has some interest for you. Okay, now. Another advantage about being by, uh, enchanted by the technology is that you're more likely to think about variations than there's a famous Sperry of the Sperry dryer scope who had hundreds of um, patents. So you should be fond of it, but not so fond that you're blind to the possibility that there may be a better way. You may be developing this and then someone has a better way. You again have to get, give it up or copy their way if you can. That's just part of it. Now, it is often impossible to predict the future of a technology. Some technology are replaced again and again, and of course, the phone is a great example of that. It just goes on and on and on, and nobody predicted that. On the other hand, if you read old copies of science, or say popular science, the flying automobile has always been around. And there's even there's companies now, but it never gets anywhere. Well, for the reasons that are obvious, it's expensive, it's awkward, the dangers, the traffic. So it, it doesn't have a going on. So, but you cannot predict this ahead of time. You can try. Finally, some technologies persist through incremental improvements. The reciprocating gasoline engine is probably one of the worst ideas invented as a diesel engine in the 1880s in Germany, right? You, by explosions, you drive a piston up and down. It has to be turned into rotary motion, which is hard and wasteful. There's friction, there's heat, there's control, which even now we do with computers. But this engine has never been beaten. People still build it for cars and even hybrid cars they put it in. It just goes on and on. Now, will it go on forever? A lot depends probably on how electrical we get in our transportation. But it's just amazing. Another technology that persists in this country uh, through is building of, of private houses. It's done the same way it's been done for many years. The materials are much better and the tools are much better. But a carpenter from 100 years ago has shown how to use a, uh, a power nailer in a day would be doing it. So that hasn't changed. And that's not, so, that's not true, of course, for commercial buildings. But it's interesting. And what does it mean? Uh, you know, people have talked endlessly about uh, producing uh, private homes and, and bringing them in on a unit basis. But this, economically, this always seems to be the way. Well, but it's also tied up, of course, with building codes and union regulations and so forth. But it does persist. 
Now I'm going to tell you about my last experience with technology. In 1950, I was working with GE, and I was in a lab attached to a factory. We were trying to make very small vacuum tubes. Uh, the main reason is that in a vacuum tube, like, there's a filament which is hot and takes power. And that was very bad for portable radios which were coming in, used up the battery fast, it was bad for uh, hearing aids. And we worked on that, making smaller and smaller ones. And a few hundred miles away in New Jersey, we were in Schenectady, New York, at, uh, <laughs> at Dole Labs, the transistor was invented. Completely different idea. And uh, the small, the tiny uh, vacuum tube w was done for, except in, it's used in some strangely enough military applications because it's not sensitive to uh, electromagnetic interference and, and a few other things. So we were completely on the wrong track, and these marvelous men uh, were on the uh, right track. Now, before I end, I'll tell you what I'm doing now. So, we're surrounded by this thing called dark energy, which is causing the universe to expand faster than we expected. Almost all, ex almost all studies of it are done through telescopes, through seeing things, galaxies moving. And I thought, well, maybe we can find it with very delicate electronic instruments and lasers through a technique called atom interferometry, uh, which is only about 20 years old, in which you s look for, f you look at atoms sort of one at a time and look for forces on them. And I know about the vacuum seemed okay, the mechanical instruction, but it uses lasers, which I knew nothing about, and ways to operate lasers called electro optics. And I thought, well, how do I get started in this field? And then I, what I've always found in the past, I just got started. I got a book or two on lasers, but they had too much. I didn't want to know the theory of them very much. And uh, what I'm depending on, I bought a couple and, and learning to use them without burning them out. I talk to my colleagues a lot. As I say, I talk to vendors, and I'm slowly learning this new technology. So you can shift fields. It's a little bit of a messy process, and you need patience and, and an institution or a company that will give you time and colleagues, but it can be done. So you're just at the beginning of your careers, and you may change many times, particularly as the technologies improve as they will. And uh, we are leaving so many problems, technical problems of all sorts, and basic problems like what is dark energy to this new generation. Uh, you have to, we, in science, tend to gloss over things we don't understand, but eventually we will get back to it. Thank you. Uh, 
I would like to see a change between the undergraduate and the graduate. The undergraduate I think, pretty much has to be the way it is. And the graduate, uh, I would reduce the number of requirements. Uh, I also, uh, people were getting really a master's thesis or a PhD thesis. It would just really have to depend on how much experience they had. They required. It would not have to be right or major something. I, I agree with you with a graduate. In the undergraduate, I, I don't see it anywhere around there. I think it's training is just like a lot of these things. Yeah. Question? Yes, uh, what motivates you to like uh, continue studying? Like, continue your research? What motivates you to continue your research? Well, I'm having such a good time, really. Uh, it really interests me uh, to work on these things and to learn new things. Uh, I would rather have struggles with. I understand the laser and design once one more of the equipment I used to build ten years ago. So it's interesting. And I look forward to Monday mornings. Not the weekend. And then I look forward to things I'm thinking about, things I want to try, and the ideas of other people. So it's a very pleasant environment to manage with the institution or the company uh, allows it to be so. It's really very I'd rather, you know, I'm old and most people I know talk about their vacations. I'm not going to lose the vacation. I'm not going to have a new idea and do the science. It's just fun. fun. One last question. Could you tell us something in brief, in brief about Tau Leptons, the particles you discovered? So yes, that's the problem we're leaving for you guys. Tau, Tau, Tau. There's an electron which was found 100 years ago. And the cosmic rays, before the 1940s, they found coming down another particle, like the electron, but 200 times heavier. It breaks up into electrons and electrons. So then, when I saw it came out the slack, and what I thought about was, there would be more of these. Why did it just do it? Once 200 times heavier, that didn't seem right. I thought, oh, there must be a lot of them. There's this one, and it's the new is heavier, there must be another one, and another. So it's a series, sort of like a series of elements. And uh, we were very lucky, we built the right machine, and then we found the tau, which is like an electron, it's 3,000 times heavy. So it's very heavy. It breaks up very quickly to electrons and muons. Now, we don't understand anything, we don't understand the size. Now, we bring up 50 times more in energy. And there are no more heavier ones. It's just these three. It's a trinity. And nobody understands what's special about the three. And why. And no one understands why the tower is 3,000 times heavier. No. And the problem is going to back. The heads, the finding the heads to help a little bit. They're not really. It's a problem being left. The young, over the again, see the theory of more experiments, we are stuck. It's completely stuck. And the older people, and you get older, that's why we want to change fields. You brainwash yourself. You say, well, that's what it is, that's what it is. Then you have to come back to dark energy. You can explain dark energy by fixing up the Einstein equations a little bit. You have to put in one more number. Figure out. Well, that's one solution. Is that a good solution? We don't understand how you have like the loss of the body. We don't understand Newton's gravity constant G. We don't understand the mass of the direction. Now, we learn. We have all these numbers that we measure very well. We don't have to calculate them. Now, some people think you cannot calculate them. So, okay. so we're leaving a lot in every field in young people. And it takes young people because they're not playing well. So, oh, maybe it's this. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
اتفاق 